The top business stories live from the Sky News City studio. The UK is almost certainly out of recession as the economy grows slightly for the second month in a row. The FTSE 100 is back above 8,000 and close to its all-time high. We'll have all the latest for you from the market. Plus, reports that the state-owned oil company of Abu Dhabi has looked at BP as a possible takeover target. Good morning, this is Business Live with me, Ian King. The UK is almost certainly out of the shallow recession it entered last year. The Office for National Statistics said this morning that the economy grew by 0.1% in February. That followed the growth it notched up in January, which the ONS today revised higher from 0.2% to 0.3%. The ONS said that GDP uh, during the three months to the end of February grew by 0.2%. With growth also expected for March, it means the economy has almost certainly emerged from the technical recession it entered last year. Technical recession, of course, defined as two consecutive quarters of negative growth. Production, in particular manufacturing, was the main driver of growth during February. That experienced an expansion of 1.1% during the month, while the services sector grew by 0.1%. Well, with me this morning is Victoria Clark. She's UK Chief Economist at Santander Corporate and Investment Banking. Victoria, great to see you this morning. Um, bang in line with expectations, but it, I guess it was that January revision that was the uh, sort of point of interest. Yeah, so January's growth looks a little bit more positive. February just scraped in, into growth. Um, you know, it's nice to have a set of numbers that put us on track to get out of recession, but it's, you know, it's not particularly inspiring. We're still yeah, closer to zero than, than strong growth. And I think it's all the manufacturing sector that's driving this. So if you look at the services sector, 80% of the economy, you know, there isn't a lot, um, you know, a lot of firing on all cylinders going there. So I think it's really, you know, still for most of the economy, a pretty tepid growth story. Yeah, although, I mean, we were up 0.2% for the three months to the end of February. I mean, can one definitively say that is it? We will be definitely in growth for the first quarter? I, I, th I think so. So we've got a plus 0.3 penciled in for, for the quarter. I mean, actually, even if you have a flat for the next month, um, you know, you're going to probably get a 0.3 or 0.4. So I think, you know, we are there. We're going to scrape out of the recession. I think... You know, it's it's probably quite good news that we haven't bounced back too strongly because, of course, you know, the Bank of England's still there fretting about inflation. So for them, in a way, you know, it's almost a kind of too good to be true number because, you know, they want growth, of course, but they don't want it too hot until they can say, right, we're done and, you know, inflation's back to target. Yeah, so we're almost in Goldilocks territory. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the, the highlight as well was, was really production and manufacturing. Very, very strong outcome. I was quite surprised by that because I was looking at some of the forecasts beforehand. People were saying, oh, it was quite a mild month. There wouldn't have been much on energy production. Yeah. And yet the ONS is citing gas as being a main driver. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it was a tricky one to call because we had wet, we had warm and we had winds. So winds is typically, you know, causing disruption to construction output. And it has been in recent months. The wet um, keeps people indoors, stops them spending, but you didn't see too much of an impact from that. There's a little bit cited. And then, yeah, the weather, you know, it was quite a warm February as, as February's go, and we thought that that would hit um, energy production, but we didn't get the big down there. We got an up. And I think the more important point probably is that manufacturing's grown quite broadly across all of the subsectors. And one standout this time is actually car production, which the UK seems to be doing really pretty well with compared to some of our uh, Euro area peers. Yeah, that's quite encouraging. Not so encouraging, construction. That was off 1.9% during the month. Again, I found that quite surprising given anecdotal evidence from the construction sector and the survey data yeah. has been reasonably upbeat. Yeah, I mean, look, there are a lot of weather effects in here. It was, uh, you know, it was decent enough in January and so the numbers swing up and they swing back. They are quite volatile. It may be that this was the wind being, you know, being quite important and in the wet rather than the warm. So it's the kind of combination of the strange weather factors that we're looking at for the month. I mean, I wouldn't read too much into it. It's quite a broad drop, but, you know, these numbers are very volatile and it's quite possible it just swings back the other way next time around. Indeed they are. I mean, uh, we got that revision for January. Is it possible, in your view, still, that the, the recession of late last year could still be revised away into the history books? It's, yeah, it's always possible. These revisions go on every time, you know, we'll get a new set of um, national accounts updates, the full big shebang set that come next um, September, this September, October time. And those are another thing to look for. So it's quite possible 
but hopefully we've all moved on and you know are talking about more consistent growth by that point. Now, it's been a big week for uh, data, and obviously the, the highlight, I guess, was the US inflation figures earlier in this week. Where does this leave the Bank of England just now? So the, the UK picture is, I mean, it's really quite, quite different from the US. So we don't have the super strong growth that the US has got. I think that the UK is still seeing pretty good disinflationary momentum, and we've got numbers on that next week. And I think that will, to some extent, set us a bit apart from the US. And the labour market is tight, but I do think that if you dig beneath the surface, you can see that it is softening and that some of the metrics of pay growth, again, we get more next week, are going the right way. So I do think that... You know, we've all got carried away in the kind of, you know, warmth of the strong US CPI numbers. But really, you know, there is a certain amount of needing to look at the UK numbers. And these look to me like, you know, the UK has its own story, which is going in a better direction for the UK central bank than, say, for the Fed. Yeah. So, I mean, we look, we look to be some way between the European central bank and the Fed, don't we? I mean, when would you have the bank first cutting rates now? Still at August. So, so August seems like, you know, a de decent chance for... for having the data on the labour market to have shown enough of a softness for pay growth to get back to something that's much more sustainable for the 2% inflation objective. And, you, you know, look, I don't see a big upturn in, in the economy between now and then. So I think that's another key difference. So I think by August, they'll have enough of, of, a, of a picture to make a start on the rate cuts. And then the interesting question is, you know, how quickly do we go from there? Yeah. Now, big, big day for the Bank of England because we've also got the Bernanke review. This is a review by the former Fed chairman, Ben Bernanke, into the bank's forecasting. What are you looking out for? So, he's been looking at all sorts of things, forecasting, processes, communications. I think there's two things that we're all quite focused on. One is that... Over history, we've got very used to them publishing these fan charts of their forecasts, which show a huge range of possibilities. And the idea is that that's not particularly helpful to guide us. So perhaps we'll get some scenarios which will, may well be equally wide, but at least pinned on different views of the world. So that's one thing that, that's quite possibly going to come out. And the other thing that we're looking at is that their forecasts are often based on the market's view of how interest rates are going to evolve. So perhaps a change from that, maybe even the Bank of England's own view of what the path for interest rates might be. And those two things will be quite important changes, particularly the latter, if we get something from them telling us their view on how interest rates might evolve. Yeah, I mean, in the US, Bernanke, of course, pioneered the so-called dot plot, where all the Fed's rate setters set out their own expectations yeah. uh, for, for where interest rates are going. Would that be helpful, something like that, here in the UK? I mean, it's trickier in a UK context. You know, we haven't got as many members popping in dots. You know, I'm a nine-member MPC. Um, I mean, I think they will be more minded to go into the collective. Like, this is the view of the committee. And then, you know, they can dissent against it if one or two members don't like it. I suspect it's probably easier in a US context and probably against, um, the, you know, the, the sense that the MPC would like to be that expi explicit. Yeah, well, that's coming out at midday, so uh, a busy day for you ahead as yes. well. Thanks, Victoria. Good Thank to see you. Thank you. Some other stories for you now. And the state-owned oil company of Abu Dhabi has reportedly looked at BP as a possible takeover target. Reuters says that Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, ADNOC, had spoken directly to BP in recent months and also sought advice from investment banks on a potential deal. But it says deliberations did not get any further than preliminary talks after ADNOC concluded BP was not the right fit for its strategy. Separately, Sky City editor Mark Kleinman is reporting that Bernard Looney, BP's former chief executive, has held talks with ADNOC about a senior advisor role. The Financial Conduct Authority said today it had written to providers of motor finance to remind them they must maintain adequate financial resources at all times. The FCA said lenders would need to ensure they were adequately prepared to meet the potential costs of customer complaints related to commission agreements on car loans. Well, the warning comes as the regulator carries out a review of discretionary commission agreements on car loans, a practice banned in 2021, but which before then allowed motor dealers to set their own interest rates on repayment plans. The FCA said today that firms involved in its review had engaged with it constructively, but had added that many firms were struggling to promptly provide the data it needed. 
Shares of Petrofac slumped by 30% this morning after the oil field services company admitted it continues to face challenges in securing performance guarantees for new contracts. The update came as Petrofac, which employs 8,500 people worldwide, said it remains in discussions with its lenders to restructure its debt, which is likely to result in a significant proportion of that debt being exchanged for shares in the business. Petrofac, which has an $8 billion order book backlog, said debts of £584 million at the end of June last year were likely to have risen since then. And the ferry operator DFDS said this morning that its passenger numbers last month were up sharply on March last year due to the early timing of Easter. The Danish company, whose routes include Dover Calais, Dover Dunkirk and New Haven Dieppe, said it carried 431 passengers during the month, up 93% on March last year. But North Sea freight volumes were below 2023 on an underlying basis, following a reduced number of sailings due to weather conditions. So the UK is almost certainly out of recession, according to the latest GDP figures. Well, let's see how that translates to individual businesses. As the country faces a general election this year, here on Sky News, we're focusing on Grimsby and Cleethorpes, towns where the election could be decided. Well, based in Grimsby, My Energy is a designer and manufacturer of renewable energy products. They include the world's first solar-compatible electric vehicle charger, Zappi. Well... Joining me now from Grimsby is Jordan Brompton. She's co-founder of My Energy. Uh, Jordan, good to see you this morning. Um, what did you make of the GDP data published this morning? Um, it's positive news. It's a positive step in the right direction. And um, I can confirm, you know, from a from a British manufacturing point of view that we saw record sales in March, which was nice to see after a really turbulent few um, months, quite frankly, in few quarters. Well, that's uh, encouraging news. Where, where are you seeing demand coming from? Is this domestically generated or from overseas? Yeah, a bit of both, actually. So mainly the domestic market, most charging is done at home. And with actually the sales of plug-in cars increasing as well, we've had 72,000 registered in uh, March. We've seen an increase in car charger sales, but not just in the UK. We also operate um, overseas as well. So Australia, um, Netherlands, Ireland and some growing sales in Germany too. That's very interesting because, I mean, a lot of the mood music around EVs lately has been fairly downbeat. Obviously, the government pushed back on the um, date at which it plans to uh, uh, do away with uh, new petrol and diesel vehicles. The, the, the kind of commentary around EVs hasn't been that positive lately. No, it certainly hasn't. And it's a shame, really, because it's not just the EV market that's taken a hit. It's the entire car market and the entire economy. So I feel like it's a little bit unfair. Um, but as I said, most industries have taken a bit of a hit the past couple of quarters. But it's promising to see that things are um, looking like they're on the up, although I'm trying not to count my lucky stars too soon. <laughs> Quite right, too. Um, I mean, you mentioned it had been a difficult few months for you. I mean, you, you were consulting on some redundancies earlier in the year. Is, is that process out of the way for you now? It is, and it was horrendous to go through and obviously not something that you ever set out to do as a, as a business owner, but hopefully we can, as the, as the market starts to build, hopefully we can take some of those roles back on. Good to hear. I mean, tell me a bit about the business. How, how come it's, uh, it's based in Grimsby? What are the origins of it? Um, so me and the, uh, my co-founder, Lee, were Grimsby born and bred. And growing up, there weren't very many um, career opportunities. So it was something that was, a, and when we were starting this business out, it was an extreme passion of mine to keep it based in the UK and in my hometown to create real careers, not just for everybody, but in particular women. And um, it's also, I'm a big champion of UK manufacturing. We do all of our manufacturing in the UK, barring the actual battery cells that we, um, we launched a battery this year. All of our other products and all of the electronics are designed and manufactured in the UK. And it's just something that I think that we need um, to, to grow our economy and that will benefit everybody. So it's just, it, come, it stems from a huge passion, but also the resilience of the Grimsby people. We've had it hard over the years and from changing industries, but this Humber, the Humber Bank is becoming a bit of a green hive of energy. Um, you know, we've got companies like Orsted and My Energy. So we're just really leaning into that. Why, why else be based anywhere? Why be based anywhere else, I say. What about the local skills base? Have you had to do a lot of your own training to get people up to speed with the kind of work you're doing? 
Yeah, um, it's not without its challenges recruiting locally, I'm not going to lie. But yeah, we've got an academy that we do a lot of with um, local apprentices. We work with upskilling local electricians. Well, not just local electricians, actually. That's a bit national electricians. We bring people to Grimsby. Um, and we also bring people in from overseas if we need the support on the development side as well. So that's something I'd like to see from the government if we're going to transition to net zero and not flip-flop on our decisions, um, we're going to need to upskill a lot of people in this country to make it happen. You've got quite a high-powered board. Uh, you've got Peter Richardson, the former Chief Operating Officer of Dyson, and uh, an old friend of this programme, Sir Terry Leahy, the former Tesco CEO. How, how did they get on board? Um, actually, Sir Terry invested back in 2019 um, as an angel investor when he heard mine and Lee's story. We would built it from scratch um, ourselves with our own money. And we had an order book that we couldn't fulfill because we couldn't um, afford to buy components. And we actually got introduced to Terry through a mutual friend and he and William Curry invested. And then later we appointed Peter Richardson as our chairman to help transition us through the next stage of growth. Um, they've been really supportive when you know the market's taken a bit of a bit of a downturn. It's been super tough because we was on this astronomical growth story, and then the economy, like all of us, we've faced challenges. And it's actually been having that level of experience has been super important on the board. Um, so I'm grateful for that. Yeah, it's good to hear, Jordan. It's great to uh, hear that uh, things are uh, on the up again for you. Thanks very much for joining us today. Do appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Still to come here on Business Live, we'll take a look at how the markets are doing this morning. Stay with us. Especially when I was younger, like during the lockdown, I read a lot and I, but the only problem was I didn't really see lots of books that had people who looked like me in it. So, one of the, my like inspirations is that I wanted to put my own face into my own book. And then also another thing is like, some of, most of my books, it's like, uh, I got inspiration through my past experiences. And that is some uh, what, and also my family values and they, that is what really inspired me to write these books. Here's Amma. I can see the likeness here, Sarah. Very good. Talk to me about the stories, the adventures you wanted to write about. So, with this book, it was mainly inspired by my trip to Ghana last year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, most of the things, for example, in one of the pages over here, it shows her feeding and like doing her chores uh, out in the garden like yeah. feeding the chickens and the goats and that's something that we i did this is the school you went to visit in ghana yes is it? uh that's the uh, school i went to visit and that is the um library that i am refurbishing we have family values where we normally um christmas time we do um packages and give to charities mm -hmm. around like homeless people around and we, we saw that joy that brought to her. So um, when, I, when she wrote the book and showed it to me and she actually came back and said, I wanted to donate the money to charity, I was surprised, but wasn't too surprised. Emirates Premium Economy. Maybe one day all airlines will have seats like this.
fly Emirates, fly better. Thank you. Time for a look now at the markets. And the FTSE 100 is flirting with an all-time high. More on that in a moment. But first, let me show you what the pound has done. Uh, it's had mixed fortunes following the GDP data this morning. As you can see, it's up by one-tenth of one percent against the euro, but it's continuing to fall against the US dollar, which is absolutely resurgent following those US inflation figures earlier this week. Sterling off nearly two-thirds of one percent against the greenback just now. On the equity markets, well, last night's gains on Wall Street, during which the Nasdaq hit a new all-time high were followed by a mixed session in the uh, Asia-Pacific region. The Nikkei, uh, really the only uh, bright spot there overnight. Well, here in Europe, here is how the markets are uh, going into the weekend. All of them uh, up by uh, nearly 1% or so just now, although there are some fallers to mention. And a major talking point this morning from continental Europe is the German battery maker Varta. It shares currently off some 28% in Frankfurt on news it does not expect to be profitable until 2026. Well, here in London, as I say, the FTSE 100 is flirting with an all-time high. It's currently up by uh, just over 1% uh, right now, some uh, nine, uh, 88 points uh, to the good just now, 20 points or so, actually about 30 points or so shy of its all-time high. Support there is coming from all of the big dollar earning heavyweights, uh, BP and Shell. I mentioned that takeover speculation with BP earlier on. You can see BP up by uh, more than two and three quarter percent. Shell and BP alone have added 27 points or so to the index on a higher oil price. Well, outside the FTSE 100. There aren't too many features around today, but the property group Great Portland Estates, we've had the CEO of that company on the programme in the recent past. Its shares currently ahead by nearly 1.5% after it received a push from one of the brokers. Further down the corporate food chain, Alpha Financial Markets Consulting is up by some 1%. That's after it issued an upbeat trading statement. Over on the uh, commodity markets, as I mentioned earlier, the oil prices uh, ahead today. That's all news that uh, Chinese oil imports were up during the first quarter of the year. The oil price is, however, set to finish the week lower. Barrel of Brent crude will currently set you back $90.78 a barrel. That is up a little under one and a quarter percent. Meanwhile, the gold price, I've mentioned that quite a few times lately, and you can see why it's hit another all-time high today as geopolitical tensions continue to swirl, and that is supporting interest in the yellow metal. And ounce of gold will currently cost you $2,397.49. That is up 1% so far today. Well, joining me this morning is Sophie lund -Yate. She's, of course, lead equity analyst at Hargreaves Lansdowne. Sophie, lovely to see you as ever. What do you make of this move in the FTSE? I mean, it's, it's a pretty broad-based rally. All the, all the continental European markets are up this morning as well. Hi, good morning. Yes, absolutely. So what we're seeing really is, as you say, it's quite broad-based optimism. And there are a couple of things feeding into, into that. One of those is that GDP reading that we've had today, which has shown uh, that the UK has technically exited uh, the recession that we had that we had uh, been not enjoying, but that we'd entered. Um, so there's a lot of kind of optimism there that actually the worst of economic pain is behind us, and that's that's boosting things. You mentioned there about the, the oil price, as much as it's set for kind of weekly losses. Uh, looking more more broadly, you know, the price is still elevated largely because of a lot of the disruption that's going on in in the Middle East, and that has huge ramifications for the big players in the FTSE, including the oil majors. We've had the news from BP today, and then also on top of all of that, we've had some upgrades to the house builders from analysts today. And of course, the FTSE is massively weighted towards those as well. So all in all, it's just a very bright Friday for the market, which is nice to say. I don't get to say that very often. <laughs> Indeed not. Tell me, talk, give me a reaction to this BP chit chat, Sophie. Yes, absolutely. So of course, um, there's the speculation or this news rather um, that a UAE company, um, state-backed oil company, had been um, flirting with the idea of, of a takeover. Now, talks didn't get to a particularly progressed stage, stage rather. Um, now, what I would say about this is it's not completely out of the ordinary. Now, this might sound like, you know, it would certainly be huge, huge news. Um, but when we look at what valuations have done more recently, it's not totally surprising there might be people circling. You know, when you, we look at BP, the price to earnings ratio, that being, of course, how much the market is prepared to pay uh, per one pound of future profit. And um, that PE ratio is sitting at around 7.5 for BP compared to 12 on a 10 year average. That's really um, some serious value territory. Um, and frankly, the, the, the nature of its assets 
are quite attractive. When you look on, on a long-term view, particularly, it's it's moved towards renewables compared to some peers. Um, so this interest is certainly very interesting, but really, really important to, to focus on the fact that actually those talks didn't progress anywhere. But could we see future uh, future speculation? Absolutely, I think we could. Yeah, as you say, it's on a bombed-out valuation. But, I mean, would it get past the regulators? I mean, we've just seen the UK government basically sort of getting very sniffy about uh, a UAE bid for the Daily Telegraph and Sunday Telegraph. I mean, but would they countenance uh, a, a bid like this for BP from, from the UAE? I do think it's prudent to expect that should uh, any talks um, of this nature get to a, a later stage, I do think that we would probably see... Uh, some some intervention. I do think that that's that that's possible. But when we look further afield, are there are there other possibilities from from other regions? Maybe. Of course, this is all purely conjecture. But I, it's certainly not something. It's certainly not the type of deal uh, that would that would certainly just just sail through without some say so from regulatory uh, hurdles. I don't think. The valuation point you made is a good one, though, because interestingly, we heard earlier in the week from Wales Sawan, the uh, CEO of Shell. I mean, he's pretty uh, ticked off at uh, the, the way the market values his business. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, valuations more, more broadly in the UK have been really pretty, pretty harsh for quite some time. Uh, you know, we have a huge amount of exposure to cyclical businesses, whether that's, whether that's um, financials or oil and gas. Um, now, obviously, the oil and gas companies have been under a lot of a lot of pressure in recent times, and I would argue, I do feel that those uh, valuations have actually been overly overly punished, particularly when you look at the likes of BP, where actually, as I was mentioning earlier, their their green credentials, while obviously. I think everybody would argue, you know, things could certainly maybe go further. Um, they are slightly more ambitious than some peers. Um, so that's really worth bearing in mind when we look at the long-term health and long-term trajectory of these companies. And briefly, Sophie, uh, AstraZeneca, we were throwing ahead to this one yesterday. They had a big shareholder vote. They actually got their way. They did indeed. So AstraZeneca's pretty divisive uh, pay package for their for their CEO has been voted through, uh, despite actually well over a third of voting shareholders voted against the um, voted against the package. And um, it's going to see their CEO paid up to eighteen point five million pounds this year. Uh, but really, a more optimistic view of this uh, would, would suggest that actually. There's a, a, an understanding that pharmaceutical giants aren't anything without their pipeline. And AstraZeneca's pipeline is actually in really good health. And the, the upper echelons of the company clearly think that the current CEO is the right man to see that continue and wants to reward him for that. But, of course, certainly a controversial amount of money. Yes, it's a great Gareth Davis. A boardroom veteran said to me once, a win's a win. <laughs> Sophie, got to leave it there. Good to see you. Thank you. That's it from me for now. I'll be back, of course, with our afternoon edition at half past four. Hope very much to see you then. Coming up next, it's Matt Balbert. Stay tuned. Thanks for joining me. Cheerio.